I chose the word crafting rather than creating very intentionally. This is not a how-to. It's a what-to, when-to, and why-to. It's about knowing how to think about your presentation. I use PowerPoint, but most of what you're about to hear will apply to Keynote, Google Slides, or whatever program you choose to use. There's a lot of work, though, that has to happen before we ever start thinking about slides or the tools we use to create them. Presentation structure is about crafting a conversation that takes your audience from their starting point when they walk in the room to a pre-selected conclusion. People do presentations for a lot of different reasons. Some of the common ones might be marketing and training. When I train, I train with what's called the military model. It's a three-step process. Tell them what you're going to teach them, teach them, tell them what you taught them. When we do a marketing presentation, it's not actually any different. We start with telling them why we're here, what we're going to talk about, what we want them to pay attention to. We tell them all about why that's the thing they should be doing, thinking, saying, or buying. And then we close with, this is why this was a great way to spend your time. All presentations are marketing presentations. There are lots of variations of what happens in that middle section, but every presentation starts from this framework. At the opening of this video, I told you a little about my history with PowerPoint and what I thought I knew that I didn't see people doing. What I didn't do was tell you about my professional history, all of my technical certifications. Those things weren't relevant to this conversation. Your audience doesn't actually need to get to know everything about you. They just need to know why they should listen to you today. It's okay to add a little bit of extra information that's relevant to the audience. If you're talking to a bunch of doctors, by all means, tell them also what you know about the medical field. But anything beyond that has the potential to backfire, make you sound like you're standing up there telling everyone how great you are, and getting them to tune out long before you ever actually start to talk about your subject. Do the same thing for your presentation. You don't have to tell them everything you're going to cover. Just a quick one to three sentence summary of what they're going to walk away with at the end of the day. Can you tell what this slide's going to be about? You might not know everything I'm about to say, but you have an idea because we've given you an outline and the slides you've seen so far lead to this place. That's how progression works. Your presentation needs a narrative, just like writing a story. It starts someplace, it goes someplace, it ends someplace. And every slide should be a step on that journey. Every slide should have a purpose, one clear topic, one clear step that moves you along that road from where they started to where you need them to end. And everything on it should have value. There's always more that we want to share. But the point of your presentation is to give your audience what they need to get where you want them to go. Anything else just makes your presentation longer, not more valuable. Have you ever listened to a kindergarten teacher try to move a group of kids? They don't say, don't run, because they know that word run is going to be what gets stuck in the kids' heads. They say, let's walk now. When you get to the end of your presentation, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to say the things that you want stuck in folks' head when they walk out. Remind them why they wanted to come. Point out to them how this was a good use of their time. And then tell them what you want them to do with that information and where to go next. How many presentations have you watched that had a lot of meaningless kind of clip art that looked like it was there just to take up space? The idea of visuals isn't to put a picture on the screen, but to use visual elements to help support your message. The best visuals are simple, meaningful, and lead your audience in the direction you need them to go. I want you to think about the visuals you've seen here so far. Even if you weren't really aware of it, each one sends a message that supports what we're talking about here. The opening title was an artist surrounded by completed drawings. That message, this is not a mechanical discussion of how to click the mouse button. This is about how we envision, craft, and create. When we started talking about structure and content, you saw a framed house. Not a completed product, but the bones that hold that house up and give it shape. And on this slide, as we start to talk about visuals, you see a simple visual that focuses your eye. Use your visuals to help align your audience's minds and expectations, even when they don't realize it's happening. Our first and most important visual element is our template. 
Start by choosing a template that reflects the appearance and mood for your presentation. The template gives you more than a consistent set of fonts and bullets. It gives you matching colors. It gives you complementary designs for different slide layouts and a consistent appearance to the product overall. Always use your template elements. When you click in a title field, if you have to apply another template later, your software will know that that's title and format it accordingly. If you just click your mouse someplace random on the screen and start typing, it doesn't know that, and you'll have to do all your formatting manually. You've been given lots of rule of this, rule of that, and various elements of your life. In presentations, it's a rule of twos. The very first rule of two is not more than two fonts and not more than two colors of text. In the early days of desktop publishing, people got very excited about the ability to change fonts and change colors, and we had what we called the ransom note effect, where overuse of changing fonts and different colors creates visual chaos. You want your visuals to add meaning, not just to be clutter. No more than two fonts, no more than two colors, and no smaller than 16-point type, but target 20-point wherever you can. Of course, text isn't the only thing that's going to be on your slide. So keep to that rule of twos. No more than two blocks of content. You may find rare exceptions, but broadly, that's about as much as people can visually process without it getting to be too crowded and difficult to interpret. Likewise, when you're working with pictures, you may want to frame some or shape them. Try not to use too many different and competing effects. You want to keep that visual consistency throughout your presentation. Finally, animations and transitions, again, Pair them and don't go beyond that. Using a different transition for every single slide just makes your audience dizzy. And that brings us to the question of what goes on your slide? The answer is in your seventh grade English class. Craft your slides the same way your English teacher taught you to craft an essay. Treat every slide like a paragraph, a one sentence purpose statement followed by supporting information. That purpose statement is your title. Craft your titles to achieve two goals. One, to identify the core topic of the slide so your audience knows what we're talking about right now. And two, to provide a table of contents later so that when they go back to your presentation, they can easily find information. Once you have that title, everything on that slide should be directly related to it. Your slides are a prompt reminding your audience of the main point while your words hold the things they want to know about that point. There's an old saying, if the slides are your presentation, why do they need you? Your audience can read the slides faster on their own. If everything you have to say is on screen, they'll figure that out pretty quickly and stop paying any attention to you. Finally, visuals are not for decoration. They should always illuminate the information that you're presenting. If adding random clip art is the only way to make your presentation engaging, you have a different problem to address. So think about what this visual tells you. These three things are all part of a single whole. They exist in balance and proportion, and the graphics are the lowest priority. Now, most people don't use speaker's notes, and those that do tend to use them like three by five cards, prompts to remind them what they were gonna say. This totally misses the point and misses out on the value of the function. Speaker's notes offer you one of the best tools to keep your audience's attention. Put everything you intend to say in your speaker's notes in full sentences. It doesn't have to be word for word, but make sure the content is there. Then at the beginning of your presentation, you can let the audience know that all of your prepared remarks are in the slide deck so they don't need to take notes. They can instead stay focused on the conversation and on engaging with you. All that extra information that you cut because it wasn't essential, put that in the notes too. Add a section at the bottom labeled additional resources, share that material, share the extra comments, share the links out to websites that will allow your audience to continue to engage with this topic once they've walked out of the room. A paper copy of your speaker's notes is great. You can also access them using speaker's view when presenting online. Have a look at this visual. It's still a simple image. The colors are a little brighter. It plays on that earlier paper boat image, a similar number of objects, but the color and layout create a totally different expectation, just in the difference of the choice of one picture. The first advanced visual most people encounter is animation. We're accustomed to seeing speakers make their bullets appear up on screen when they want them to. But animation is good for so much more than that. You can use animation to drive your audience's focus. 
Remember when we were talking about the ransom note effect? We animated the ransom note image to cover text and make sure your attention was focused right where we wanted it to be. You've seen folks add a big red arrow on the screen, and that's the basic version of this. And I say basic because when you leave that arrow on the screen, it becomes a distraction. Once you're done with it, the next thing for us to do is to make sure that it goes away. Most of us are used to animations that play when we click the mouse. Animations can also be set to play automatically, immediately or with a delay, to run once or to repeat, and to make content disappear. There was a time when clip art was all we had, but today we have lots more options for finding effective images to support our presentations. Icons allow us to dress up an existing image. You saw that earlier on the what goes on your slide image. Each section of our circle was decorated with an icon. The icons here have been enlarged and had their colors changed to provide a visual accent. You'll also see options for online and stock images. Online images come from all over the web. To ensure you're on the right side of copyright law, it's a good idea to look for options that limit your searches to Creative Commons and royalty-free files. Some online image searches can even be filtered to provide results that are a particular shape or color scheme to match your presentation. Stock images are licensed images that are paid for usually as a part of a subscription. In addition to pictures, you may also see options for cutouts and videos. Cutouts are human shapes with no background that you can easily insert into your slide regardless of your color scheme. Videos are video loops. They end the same way they began, so they can be run continuously. We talked about animation as a means of guiding audience focus. Video can be used the same way. For example, with all the additions, this slide is busy. It's kind of hard to know where to look now. But add a video to the background, and we regain our focus. You can also use video loops on their own to offer a visual indicator for things like meeting breaks. Once you have your pictures, the next question is, how do you use them well? You've probably heard some things about image placement, balancing your images against your text and your white space to create an overall smooth look. But it's more than just finding a clear space to put it in. Have a look at this image. Our template has a bunch of angles, and this, sitting out in the middle of nowhere, just looks a little weird. Maybe I just can't have a round image on this slide. Or maybe I can take advantage of my slide template and move this to nestle it into that angle and make it look a little bit more like it belongs. Sometimes the image itself doesn't fit. We crop the edges off, but there's just weird stuff in the corners. Look for crop to shape options that will help you create an image that meets your needs. For example, our round cup of coffee originally looked like this. Another set of tools to look for are those that help you remove backgrounds or set a transparent color. Our cactus looks really good, but its background gets in the way. And cropping, even using a shape that minimizes the outside edges, doesn't really help. But the background is a very solid single color that doesn't appear anywhere else. Turning it transparent suddenly makes our cactus fit in a little bit better. That last slide, in my view, looks like this. It's important to have a plan for the slide before you start so that you can work from the bottom up and not be constantly having to dig through the layers and elements in order to get to something you need to edit. So now you know how to structure your content, how to make it attractive and engaging. You're ready to go, right? Not quite. First, rehearse. Most of us rehearse in our heads, staring at our slides, but this doesn't do everything we need to prepare us to stand in front of a room and speak. Are you ready to give your presentation? The tools I'm about to discuss are specific to PowerPoint, but whatever software you use probably has some version of it. If not, you can get access to PowerPoint for the web free from any Microsoft account, and these features are available to you. The first one is Rehearse with Coach. When you use this option, an AI listens to you give your presentation and then offers suggestions for improvement. For example, letting you know where you pause for too long or say, um, a lot. Next, rehearse or even record your timings. This lets you practice your presentation, makes note of when you advance your slides, and can store those settings for you. The program can advance your slides automatically for you during your presentation so that you can focus on having your conversation with your audience. Finally, if you're giving your presentation in a large venue where you have to use their presentation station, save your presentation as a PowerPoint show 
you'll get a file that launches directly into presentation mode without displaying the PowerPoint working window. When your presentation finishes, it'll exit directly back to the desktop. In addition to thinking about how you're going to deliver the information, think about how your audience may consume it. If a visually impaired attendee wants to review your presentation file later, is it accessible to their screen reader? Use the accessibility checker inside of your application to help make sure that your message is accessible to your audience, whether you're in the room or not. The same thing goes for subtitles. Check whether your application can provide live captioning so that hearing impaired audience members will be able to follow your presentation. Finally, consider whether standing in front of a room is the only way that people are going to consume this content. You can record your presentation to video, including narration and slide timings. And for certain types of informational presentation, you may want to set them up to run in kiosk mode, which just loops them continuously on, for example, a computer in the lobby of your building. A few more practical options for presentation day. You know the first one I'm going to tell you is don't read your slides. Everything you've learned today about crafting slides is geared toward putting the skeleton on the slides and the meat in your words. Science backs that up. When presenters read slides, audience engagement dies. But you've heard that advice a million times, and now you know how to craft slides that support it. So let's talk about a couple of things that may actually make a difference on presentation day. First is presenter view. That's a PowerPoint name for it, but look for something similar in your own application. If you're giving your presentation inside of certain applications like Microsoft Teams or to a second monitor such as a projector, use presenter view to give yourself a different look than what your audience sees. With presenter view, your audience sees your slides, but what you see is your slides, the upcoming slides, and your speaker's notes right there on screen. In a video conference, that allows you to look straight at the screen instead of down at your keyboard or the papers on your desk and still access your speaker's notes. And when you're standing in front of a room full of people, it still puts your notes right there with no shuffling of pages. Every time you change slides, the correct notes are there with it. Absolutely can't be beat for making sure that you have the right set of notes in front of you every second of the way. If the venue you're presenting in doesn't allow you to use this function, you still have the option of presenting live. Your presentation has to be stored in a OneDrive or a SharePoint in order to use this feature in PowerPoint. Check the capabilities of your own native app if you use something else. Present Live gives audiences a web link and a QR code that allows them to connect directly to your presentation without any screen sharing needed. They can move forward in your presentation as far as you have, but not past you. And they can independently go back and look at previous slides. They can also offer live emoji-based feedback they can choose a language for subtitles and get a live translation of your presentation as you speak. And afterwards, they'll be offered a survey and you'll get a summary of the results. If you give a lot of presentations, you'll find yourself often modifying a presentation to meet the needs of a specific audience. There are a couple of tricks you can use to make that a little easier. First, use sections to organize your slides. You can expand and contract them, drag an entire section to a different place in your presentation to move your content around, and hide or show entire sections if you need to customize the presentation. Most of the presenters I know have six or seven copies of each of their main presentations. Each copy has a slight difference, a slight variation, or was created custom. And what happens is over time, they update slides in some of them, forget to update slides in others, and that content goes out of sync. If you need to add custom data for one presentation, duplicate the data slide, hide the original, update the copy, poof, you have a presentation customized for your current audience, and when you're done, you can hide their custom data, show your original file, and you're back where you were in the beginning. If you do multiple versions of the same presentation, for example, a training class that you give as a 30, 45, or 60 minute course, use the custom shows option to set up collections of slides. Essentially, you can tell PowerPoint, show all 20 slides for my full hour long training. But for the 45 minute version, show slides 1 through 10, 12 and 14. And for the 30 minute version, only show slides 1 through 10. When you get ready to give the presentation, you can simply select which one you want to use and PowerPoint just won't show the slides that you haven't included. All of your information stays in one file. When you have to do updates, everything gets updated. And if you do all of these things, your presentations will be more effective and audiences more likely to stay awake. Okay, really, what did we learn today? 
When we ask that question, people naturally start thinking about the bullet points, but we're gonna look at this from a slightly bigger picture standpoint. You've learned today that all presentations are marketing presentations. They all have an open, a pitch, and a close, but their structure is defined not by your outline, but by how your message progresses. You've learned how to craft effective slides, including planning and thinking about your content, balancing your visual items, and using them to manage your audience's attention. You've learned how to share information beyond presentation day, including asynchronous sharing using video and kiosks. You've got some extra tools for presenting online, and you've learned how to manage multiple versions of a presentation without having to manage duplicate and conflicting files. So now that you've learned all this great new stuff, I'm gonna invite you to go back and look at your own presentations. Find one that you think works really well and one that you're less comfortable with and compare them both to the things you've learned here. How much of that comfort and success is related to following these rules? How much of that discomfort could be alleviated by going back, reviewing your presentation and applying some of the concepts you've learned here? If you have a question or a great suggestion for something I missed, please drop it in the comment. I'm Nixie, and this has been Nixie Knows. Thanks for spending time with me today. If you learned something useful, please click like so that YouTube will be more likely to show someone else that's something useful too. If you know exactly who needs to see it, click share. Make sure they get a chance to come spend a few minutes with me too.